is the tenth and final day of the national air race. Event 26, a ten-lap free-for-all held on a five-mile circuit. The winner is Douglas H. Davis, a 30-year-old native of Atlanta, Georgia. His plane, an R-model travel air, the mystery ship, powered by a 400-horse right whirlwind radial engine. As the red and black monoplane crossed the finish line, it ushered in a new era in the sport of air racing. For the first time, a civilian pilot in a commercial airplane emerged the victor over a field of military aircraft. It would be felt for a decade. Ten magical years spanning the eve of the Great Depression to the dawn of World War II. Today, thanks to the efforts of individuals like Bill Turner and organizations such as the Experimental Aircraft Association, the glory of the golden age of air racing is kept alive and before the public. The history of these important events is not only being collected and treasured, but the very spirit of the times has been renewed by the construction of replica aircraft, such as the GBs, the Mystery Ship, and Mr. Mulligan. The successful revival of these races has aided race historians in determining the flight characteristics of the originals. From the close of the First World War to Doug Davis's 1929 victory, America's air races had been dominated by the military. Eclipsed by European advances during the war, the United States emerged from the conflict with a renewed focus on gaining air superiority. Races such as the Pulitzer Cup showcased the military's quick recovery. And by the late 1920s, Army and Navy leaders were largely satisfied with the results. Into the void of the departing armed forces, rushed a brotherhood of pilots, designers, builders, and other aviation proponents whose methods would resemble those of the early pioneers of powered flight. Often operating on shoestring budgets, cannibalizing both equipment and ideas from existing technologies, these men and women literally carried aviation to the threshold of the Second World War. We didn't have wind tunnels and all that in those days. Everybody was their own. And the so we all worked and one would watch the other. And if he did something that really was outstanding, we'd copy it. See, so we, we were part of that era of, of, of making aviation what it is today. In striving to achieve a goal of a faster aircraft, the air racers demonstrated the major aviation innovations of the period and provided widespread exposure on the stage of the national air races, as well as at smaller local contests. To the public, fascinated with aviation folk heroes like Lindbergh and Earhart, the races furnished what was often the only tangible outlet for those interested in flight. The races, especially the nationals, were more than just a series of contests. Besides the many racing events and aerobatic shows, the nationals provided musical reviews, parades, firework displays and expositions. In their heyday, attendance at these tournaments rivaled and even surpassed those for baseball games. The 
popularity of the Nationals was based on a threefold promise of excitement. First were the races themselves. The Bendix and Thompson competitions were the World Series of Depression Aviation. Lavish trophies were bestowed by beaming sponsors. The races commanded front page coverage. Next were the personalities. A collection of pilots, designers, and builders. A loose fellowship of men and women, part scientist and part adventurer. With fans able to choose from both flamboyance and calculating reserve, there was a hero for everyone. Finally, there were the planes, the GBs, and Waddell Williams. Designs by Laird, Howard, and Whitman. Expectations were fulfilled and shattered. Those airplanes represented uh, the ultimate in speed. Those who flew those airplanes were the heroes. It was front page uh, news. That was exciting to the people of the world. But the trinity of pilot, plane, and race thrilled audiences for a decade. The national air races were an annual affair. And although they were also loosely known as the Cleveland Air Meets, during the 30s, Chicago hosted them once and Los Angeles twice. Many events were packed into the Nationals, but the most prestigious races were the Bendix and the Thompson Trophy races. Although a Thompson Cup had been awarded to Doug Davis in 1929, the first official Thompson Trophy race was held in Chicago in 1930. The trophy was named after its sponsor, Charles E. Thompson, producer of aviation spark plugs. The contest was of an unlimited class. Any make, model, or engine was acceptable. The event was flown on a closed course around pylons. Hence, the racers gained the nickname Pylon Pushers. In 1931, industrialist Vincent Bendix began sponsorship of a cross-country race. Contestants covered a distance of more than 2,000 miles, and it too was open to all manner of aircraft. Seven of the 1930s Bendix races were flown between Los Angeles and Cleveland, Ohio. The others, held in 1933 and 1936, began in New York and finished in Los Angeles, also the site of the Thompson races for those years. An additional purse was offered to pilots who were willing to continue from Cleveland to attempt transcontinental records. Jimmy Doolittle flew on to New Jersey in 1931 to establish the first of these records with an overall time of 11 hours, 16 minutes, and 10 seconds. This is Jimmy Doolittle. I flew in the Bendix race. I'm not sure it was the first one, but whichever one it was, I won it. In the next eight years, the record for transcontinental flight was shortened five times. And a new women's record was established in 1938. Customarily, it was the winner of the race who went on to attempt a record. But in 1934, Roscoe Turner left Burbank a day late and set a new record at just over the 10-hour mark. The Nationals were organized by Cliff Henderson, the owner of a Nash automobile dealership in Santa Monica. A shrewd promoter and businessman, Henderson started his career by collecting souvenirs from World War I battlefields, which he then sold to purchase his first airplanes, three war surplus jennies, still in their original crates. In 1928, he and his brother Phil inaugurated the first National Air Races and International Aeronautical Exposition at Mines Field outside of Los Angeles. Henderson truly loved aviation and was a consummate organizer, right down to the parking facilities. 
he took criticism of his races personally, and in 1930 defended the Nationals in the pages of Aero Digest. The National Air Races may be truthfully described as the laboratory of the aeronautical industry. In them and from them, engineering and aerodynamic problems, safety, comfort, speed, are all advanced. Everyone interested in aeronautics must profit by attendance. Although it is true that many laymen are primarily attracted to the grandstands in search of thrills, all unconsciously absorb some basic knowledge of flying. They acquire a real foundation for further interest. The pilots, too, were involved in the races for the love of aviation. No doubt some participated for the money, but purses were never very large, considering the investment involved. A sense of adventure carried the racers, and the prospects of glory loomed high on the horizon. Jimmy Doolittle, winner of the Bendix in 1931 and the Thompson in 1932, would later lead the famous raid on Tokyo during the early days of World War II. For Steve Whitman, the Golden Age heralded the beginning of a racing career that would develop even further during the post-war years and reward him with the winningest record in air racing's history. Like Whitman, Art Chester designed and flew his own aircraft, most notably the Jeep and Goon. Chester, a shy and reserved man, managed his own airport in Illinois and later designed Manasco engines to finance his racing. Another designer pilot was Jimmy Waddell, who had only a ninth grade education, was blind in one eye, and could not read a blueprint. Backed by businessman Harry Williams, Jimmy's Waddell Williams aircraft won three consecutive Bendix and two consecutive Thompson trophies. Not all the pilots were men, however. The cross-country Bendix competition was twice won by women. I love to fly air races. I have flown from three to 12 air races a year. But I get the biggest thrill out of a race against men. It's much more fun to beat the men than it is the women. In 1936, the first women's victory was scored by the team of Louise Thaden and Blanche Noyes. Two years later, Jacqueline Cochran would repeat the honor. Unquestionably, the most flamboyant aviator was Colonel Roscoe Turner, winner of one Bendix and three Thompson races. Sporting a waxed mustache and wearing green pants, a red flight jacket, and a peaked officer's cap, Turner cut a dashing figure indeed. In addition to his racing career, Turner also flew for the Gilmore Oil Company, along with an unusual passenger, a full-grown lion the company mascot. Gilmore the Lion was fitted with his own parachute in case of emergencies. Within the atmosphere of lightheartedness and camaraderie was a realistic acceptance toward the inevitable dangers of racing. Crashes were commonplace, and death was often the price that the races extracted. One such race was the 1934 Thompson. Doug Davis and Roscoe Turner occupied first and second place, both piloting Waddell Williams aircraft. Davis, who had also won that year's Bendix, held a comfortable lead. Then, on the eighth lap, as he rounded pylon number two, he entered a high-speed stall and crashed in a nearby field. Davis, who had initiated the Golden Age, was dead. Turner went on to win his first Thompson Trophy, but he accepted it in an uncharacteristically somber mood. Death threaded its way through the Golden Age. The list of those who gave their lives for the love and advancement of their sport would be too long even if it included only one pilot. For the true racing enthusiast, there was a second set of heroes sharing the spotlight with the pilots, the airplanes themselves. 
Each plane was as individual as the pilots who flew them. Most were built layer by layer. Design considerations were taken into account as they were constructed. Many were improved and transformed as the years went by until they were almost unrecognizable from their original form. They grew and matured like children. I built Chief Oscars in Oscars in 1931, and I raced it up through end of 38. At Oakland, California, the last race I run in with Chief Oscars, had a Manasco C4S, which is a supercharged. Remember, it's only a little four-cylinder engine. Before the Golden Age, the preferred racer was a biplane. Doug Davis's low-wing travel air changed all that, but not before a Bendix and a Thompson were won by biplanes designed by Matty Laird. Speed Holman's solution triumphed at the 1930 Thompson, while Jimmy Doolittle claimed the Bendix piloting the Super Solution in 1931. The next several years belonged to two makes of aircraft, the Waddell Williams Racers and the incredible GBs. Accepting the first Bendix race, from 1931 to 1934, both the Bendix and Thompson were won by these aircraft. The GB was the brainchild of the Granvilles, five brothers from New Hampshire. These stout and stubby racing planes dominated the 1931 Nationals. One model, the GBZ, won every race in which it was entered, including the Thompson. Unfortunately, the Granville's moment in the spotlight was brief. Plagued by fatal crashes, the GBs gained an undeserved bad reputation. To compound matters, in 1934, the eldest brother, Zantford Granny Granville, was killed when he attempted to avoid several workmen who were standing on the airstrip he was landing on. Several weeks later, Jimmy Waddell was also killed while giving instruction to a student pilot. 1935 was the year of Mr. Mulligan. Built by Benny Howard, who flew it with Gordon Israel to a Bendix victory. Mr. Mulligan also won the Thompson Trophy for that year, this time flown by Harold Newman. Benny Howard was also responsible for the feisty Pete, Mike, and Ike. To bring you up to date, Benny Howard won the cross country race, which was the Bendix. I won the Greve race with the Howard Mike, uh, and I won the Thompson with the Mulligan. So it was a clean sweep on, on the big stuff. As the 1930s drew to a close, the national air races began to lose some of their sparkle. What began as a 10-day program had by 1939 dwindled to a mere three events held over the Labor Day weekend. The Bendix lost some of its charm as commercial transcontinental flights became commonplace. The final races were flown at 20,000 feet using the instruments that were now a requirement of the race. The feel of adventure was fading. Rain postponed the 1939 Thompson until the day after Labor Day, when most spectators had returned to work. Roscoe Turner easily won by lapping the field twice, although he did not break his record speed of 283.419 miles per hour set the previous year. When he landed, he announced that he was retiring. Cliff Henderson was also calling it quits. He and his brother were giving up the management of the national air races. It was time to move on. In the October 1939 issue of Aero Digest, journalist Cy Caldwell wearily summarized the year's racing situation. The whole subject of the national air races should be carefully studied is the opinion of many aviation people who don't want to see the national dwindle away to nothing which is the way it seems to be heading today. In the past years, the national air races were truly the proving grounds of aviation. The production of such ships as the GB and the Mystery S Travel Air, for instance, showed the Army Air Corps that their biplanes were out of date. 
But who can point to any advances in these past few years? Now, where do we go from here? Although no one knew it, the days of the great races were over. On September 1st, the same day as the national time trials, one day shy of the 11th anniversary of Doug Davis's Thompson Cup victory, Germany invaded Poland, and the Second World War officially began. The workshops of the aviation community would soon be open to international concerns. What had once been used as a vehicle for sports competition was now a major tool of war. In one stroke, air racing fell victim to a different kind of contest, one with the harshest set of rules. For seven years, there were no national air races. When they resumed in 1946, they were once again dominated by military aircraft, including new jet aircraft. The races were now a contest of pure speed, run by the best and cutting edge aircraft. No one was attempting to advance aviation. It was time to sit back for a while and enjoy the harvest of technology brought about by the war. The goals of the depression racers had finally been achieved at the cost of their own existence. It was not only the beginning of a new chapter in the sport of competitive air racing, a whole new rule book would have to be written. like to learn more about air racing during the 1930s, an excellent companion to this program 
is the Golden Age of Air Racing by Wes Schmid and Truman Weaver. This 553-page book is a comprehensive history of Depression-era racing and features hundreds of rare photographs, pilot profiles, in-depth listings of race results, and much more. The Golden Age of Air Racing is available through the EAA Aviation Foundation for $29.95 plus shipping. To order or for more information, call 1-800-843-3612.